Okay. Um, today we're going to talk about stem cells and Jeremy's jellyfish, since we've been talking about it all day. Um, who am I? I'm Long Nguyen. I'm a senior engineer on the Bosch team at VMware. I'm a Bosch approver. I've been a Bosch user. I've been making a lot of Bosch releases since 2013, and I've been a core contributor since 2021. So why? Um, security updates. Um, but that's boring, right? But boring things are still important, right? We, we need to keep up with the times and keeping up with different operating systems. Um, Bionic um, ends of support in April of next year, so I think this is just our next evolution. So what is Jeremy Jellyfish? Um, it's a new LTS version of Ubuntu. Um, support is till April 2027. Um, Bionic, like I said, ends uh, next, year, next year in April. And I think this is important because this shows that we're continuing to use Cloud Foundry and Bosch for years to come, right? We're not just being 2023, we're over it, no updates from the community and whatnot. It's just a bigger commitment towards that. So what's new? Um, I think the biggest change is switching from OpenSSL um, 1 to 3, which causes kind of different issues with different things. Um, by default, Ruby 3.0 is installed, uh, GCC 11, and the Linux kernel 5.15. So upgrading to Jeremy, um, we were forced to use Ruby um, 3.0 because Ruby 2.7, which a lot of the CPIs were using, was um, out of support uh, as of December of last year. So I think part of migrating Jeremy was upgrading all the CPIs to start using Ruby 3. Um, and then there was some kind of different things like HA Proxy and Nginx that we were running into compilation issues that we started migrate, migrating them to just newer versions that supported OpenSSL 3. Um, and then you might run into some uh, GCC issues. Um, in GCC 10, it changed from the flag of uh, common to no common as the default. So we, um, we had to change that flag. So if you have anything that's compiling, I think with HA proxy and Nginx, we are running, you can kind of see the multiple definition uh, multiple definition, and that's usually something that you need to update in your Bosch release. Um, some current issues that we're working on right now is um, with Ruby 3.1, we're seeing kind of an increased memory usage within the director in some of the CPIs that are still using it. Um, currently, we're testing using Clang instead of GCC. Um, and in the initial test so far, it's showing promising results with like the vSphere CPI being kind of almost 2x faster. Um, but this is still kind of current testing. Clang kind of takes quite a while to compile. So once we start rolling out these changes, it's something to try to use the pre-compile things. Um, but that, there's not really much co going on with the new OS. Um, there wasn't much for, yeah, um, but we were able to release this fairly quickly. Um, we based this off the Docker image that was pre-released with Ubuntu for, since I think we started the work in January or December of last year. And by the time we got to February, March, we kind of had a stable release that we were just waiting till the official release of April to release. So it was kind of a smooth transition. And we were able, with all the Bosch releases, have everything ready, all the Ruby releases, all the packages. Um, so major changes to use OpenSSL 3. So if anyone's compiling anything and seeing any weird issues, um, try to update to the latest software with that. Um, and yeah, with the LTS support to 2027, we'll have at least have a stem cell. Um, and I think CF deployment is fairly close to being able to use the Jeremy stem cells. And that was a quick talk. Um, does anyone have any questions about Jeremy? Does anyone have any issues upgrading this stuff over? Is anyone using Jeremy yet? <laughs> okay. Well, thank you for coming to my quick lightning talk. <laughs> I am a tech lead in the Tanzu application area over at VMware, and I've been working on Cloud Foundry since about 2012, 2013, when it came over from VMware to Pivotal, and, and then, you know, full circle now. So it's been quite a fun experience. Uh, today, I want to talk to you folks about modernizing our VM choices and infrastructures and trying to 
get the size of a CF deployment down to be something reasonable. So let us explore. Now, if you don't know, these three tools collaborate together to deploy Cloud Foundry, right? Bosch deployment, Bubble, and CF deployment together make a cluster of VMs that is, in fact, a Cloud Foundry. Um, and this has been the case for quite a long time. CF deployment and Bubble are maybe five or six years old at this point. Uh, Bosch deployment's a little bit newer. People used to use this micro Bosch bootstrapping technique, but now we're, we're standardized on a very similar deployment model for Bosch as we do for Jumpbox and lots of other VMs, which is really cool. But the problem is that our VM choices are bad, right? They're old and they're inefficient. And there's two reasons you should care, and it's gonna resonate with you for one or the other, right? You're either like, why is this costing so much money? Or why am I burning all this, like, you know, generating all this CO2, running all these servers that I'm paying for that I'm not using effectively? Uh, so this is bad, right? I think we can all agree this is bad. If you are a new person to Cloud Foundry and you deploy one and you look at how many VMs there are and how expensive they are, uh, you're gonna be fairly shocked, right? You're gonna say, whoa, uh, that's $2,500 a month or $3,300 a month. And it deploys like a huge number of VMs there. That's the, the, the full inventory for how many VMs you get. Um, so it's a lot of VMs and it's really expensive. So this luckily is a solvable problem. How will we solve it is going to be extremely obvious. Um, first, we have to look at the size of VMs that existed before. And when we analyzed what Cloud Foundry uses, we realized there's only three VM sizes in Cloud Foundry, right? <laughs> it's like, and they're all really silly names. We got minimal, we got small, which also sounds like minimal, and then we got small high mem, which also sounds like small, but I guess it has more memory. So, so just right away, you can tell from the names, these are not supposed to be big VM sizes. Here were the choices that we used before this migration across the three infrastructures. I wanna highlight, we all agree there should be a difference between minimal and small, and on AWS, there are both M4 larges. Uh, there's some huge VM in the small high mem on Azure. Uh, so this is a mess. And so there's, you know, there's two problems, right? They're like too large, probably, and they're not consistent. There's no definition that makes sense between these different infrastructures about what a small actually means. So, woo, sorry. We came up with this proposal. Uh, basically, let's analyze, right? Let's analyze the VM sizes that are out there. Let's standardize. Take those three primary, you know, three to five VM types and really standardize them to find what a minimal is, to find what a small is. Now we gotta match it to the different infrastructures. Look over the three supported IaaS's in CF deployment and, and bubble and try to figure out what's the latest and greatest, what's the right, right sizing for those VMs. Um, we'll just roll out the new sizes. Oh, surprise, there's a secret second goal for this project. We would like to reduce the cost of a Cloud Foundry so that it can migrate out of VMware into the foundation. So VMware hosts between one and $5 million a year of open source continuous integration infrastructure. And nobody wants that because the foundation and the open source community would like to be able to cut its own releases and do its own testing, but the cost is a little too high. So we can't migrate the infrastructure from VMware, you know, off of VMware's books onto the foundations without decreasing the cost. Now, if we can re decrease the cost, maybe we can get this infrastructure all moved over into the CFF, right? And if we can get it moved over into the CFF, then, you know, open source community is going to be able to cut its own releases, right? And own its own infrastructure. And we see this playing out in really small areas, like in Bosch uh, with new Jammy pipelines and Bionic pipelines. We see it playing out in the CF deployment, uh, new pipelines that are getting set up on that working group. So secret second goal. Next, on to step two, let's standardize these. Uh, you know, there's a lot of details about what a standard, what we chose here, but you got to ask yourself some basic questions. How small is too small, right? Could I make, use these burstable VMs where there's not much guaranteed CPU capacity? Is that going to be acceptable? Um, if I downsize, something bad going to happen? 
Like in Diego, by the way, you downsize someone's Diego cell, they just lose half of their memory capacity, right? So like the amount of memory on Diego, it turns out to be part of your interface. Um, so it's a little scary to downsize it. You should think about those effects. This is what we came up with. So um, basically everything is different except one VM and everything is cheaper. Uh, so that's, that's great. You can see a lot of burstable sizes. If you know these infrastructures well, you'll see burstable sizes everywhere. The B series, the E series is burstable, the T series on AWS. Every one of these is burstable. And so we decided that burstable was acceptable uh, as long as it was able to maintain a certain baseline. Uh, we can't have you burst down to like a VM that has basically no guaranteed baseline. I was really worried about Amazon. I was like, oh, they only give you like 10 or 20% CPU guaranteed baseline, right? And I was like, it's not enough. Then I read the fine print on the T3 series, unlimited burst. You can burst as much as you want all the time, all day, every day. They will charge you for it if you do too much bursting, but like this is exciting, right? So all of, you know, there's a lot of analysis that went into these. Um, the second thing you'll notice is that they are all the same, basically the same, right? We now have a definition for a small high mem. It turns out it was two cores and 16 gigs of RAM the whole time. No, it wasn't. We just made that up, but it's actually standardized now, right, across these different tiers. You'll notice much cheaper. Awesome. Great. Good job, everyone. This is going to be amazing. High fives all around. Uh, we'll just, you know, roll out these new sizes and uh, we'll just leave that little implementation detail for the reader. And look at this great cost savings we're going to get here. Those graphs are definitely lower on the right. Now, now we actually actually you know, have to roll this out. Uh, how do we change the VM sizes on Cloud Foundry again? There's like four ways you can get tricked into thinking that you're changing the VM sizes on Cloud Foundry. There's like VM sizes just all over the place and you're like, I'm gonna edit the one in CF deployment wrong. I'm gonna edit the one in uh, you know, Bosch deployment wrong. Uh, there actually is a Go file inside of Bubble that we discovered is actually the one where the orange arrow is. That is how you change the deployment, uh, the size of the VMs in Cloud Foundry. Um, but the director and the Jumpbox VMs are a little bit more obvious, like they're properly associated, right, with the Bosch deployment or with the Jumpbox deployment. Um, so once we figured out that was the right size, edited it, you know, had to make a variety of PRs. Uh, and released a new version of Bubble, right? And a new version of Bosch deployment and Jumbox deployment. Um, this took about nine PRs across like six repos because like there were actually a lot of changes. There were a lot of submodules. I don't like submodules, but we had to update them. It wasn't, it wasn't great, but we you know, rolled this thing out uh, successfully and there were absolutely no problems. Uh-oh, there actually was a problem. Matthew's like, hey, wait a minute. Uh, I'm the, we're seeing a lot of failures that we weren't seeing earlier. Um, how, much, how much testing did you do? Uh, and at which point I explained to him, uh, we were always going to test it after we released it by gathering a lot of data about how it fails, right? Because these are flaky scenarios and it's hard to predict exactly how frequently we're going to get flakes. Um, so we commenced rapid analysis, right? Trying lots of permutations of how you run cats. Lots of permutations of different VM sizes, right? Different infrastructures and so on. Measuring whether they're green or red. Matthew and I went back and forth. Uh, Matthew Coker a lot. He was really helpful. And we figured out basically how to get this consistent by tweaking the cats, by tweaking the VM sizes just slightly. Um, and, you know, some more emergency PRs later, we were able to finally realize some cost savings here. And this is what it looks like. Ah, that's a big number up there and it becomes a smaller number there. And if you look at these different colors, these are Google um, colors like of different SKUs. And so like the whole, a couple of the SKUs just disappear. The N1 SKUs just disappear and are replaced by new colors that represent the E2 SKUs, which are the much cheaper SKUs. Cool, so what now? We did it, huge success. Uh, the cost of a long live safe deployment has fallen. I mean, this thing costs $600 a month and it used to cost uh, $2,000 a month. So I would say a huge success. Concourse benefits, uh, any, any Bosch deployment benefits if you're using the standardized VM sizes, small, medium, large, small, high mem, minimal, medium, high mem. We only standardized like a handful 
of VM sizes. And if you, um, if you want to take advantage of the new VMs, you can name them directly, too. Like, there's new sizes available. Um, on Google, you'll get E2 standard 4, right? On AWS, you'll get M5A, X large, you know, whatever. Um, all you have to do, of course, is upgrade bubble and bubble up. Otherwise, this won't take effect. And this means that there's now enough CFF budget, right? It means that there's enough budget to run a concourse and a CFD per working group. And, uh, you know, people can move these pipelines over. Now, it's not easy to move these pipelines over. I don't want to trivialize that, but we have the money for it now in the CFF. And the working group leads are tasked with creating concourses that all of the teams that they support and the projects they support can, can, can move their pipelines into. Um, we don't have, like, enough budget to have concourse per team, but we have enough to have a concourse per working group and, like, a permanent CF deployment or two per working group. Cool. Um, so all they had to do was bubble up again, right? All we all had to do in this room was bubble up and, uh, you know, and, and deploy, right? So everybody did that, right? Right? Uh, the answer is no. Nobody did that, basically. Uh, this is, the, <laughs> this is the, the financial metrics I look at and for how much N1 across the open source stuff, how many of the, of, of the different uh, Google SKUs we're consuming. The red and, <laughs> and blue at the top are N1s, and you do see a small drop in those N1 consumption and a small increase in E2s right there. But that's not much, right? We haven't actually moved that much over. We have the power to pull this graph down pretty far, you know, to a thousand or you know, six hundred dollars a day. <laughs> but we have the power to pull that down pretty far if we want to. So please go back and do this. Um, if you use VMware Toolsmiths, and this is like a semi-proprietary thing we do that then the open source community does, then you're like, whoa, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, but if you do it, good news, we were able to roll it out unilaterally without talking to you, right? Because these are pooled environments that get recycled, and they just got recycled automatically, and you can see the drop from when we rolled it out. It's also cyclical, so you, know, you can ignore the, the cycle, but if you look at the maximum, you can see a drop. So here's my action to you. Go bubble up your environments, and don't forget to deploy after you bubble up, at which point the new VM sizes will be in place, and then the cost of all of this will go down, and we won't be generating nearly as much carbon. So anyway, thank you for listening to my exciting financial talk here on cloud finance. This is one of my favorite topics. We'll talk cloud finance, VM sizes, hyperscalers with anybody who wants to any day. And uh, anybody have any questions on this since I finished a tiny bit early? Yeah, you can yell it. I can repeat it. Arm, arm, yeah, yeah, right. I was like, we're going to M6, right, or whatever. Uh, Gravit MG. What's this G thing? And it's like, uh oh, that's not that's not an Intel processor. That's not an AMD processor. That's an ARM processor. So, what does it take to get us into like those really low cost chipsets? Uh, probably a ton of stuff, right? Like you try running containerized Intel applications on top of ARM. The reality is, we are, are running a platform to host applications that we didn't write. So those applications usually are Intel or AMD applications. So even if you can get all of Cloud Foundry and all the stem cells to work on ARM, someone's going to want to run a, you know, a, an Intel application, unfortunately. It's like Windows. Like, you know, it's like this whole extra architecture that you need to support. So it would be like an AND, not a conversion, unfortunately. So you could have a pool of Diego cells that run ARM workloads. Right, we could. We could have a pool of Diego cells that run ARM workloads. We could have build packs that support ARM workloads. Ryan's already gone. But anyway, you get the idea. So there could be ARM support in the future, but I think it's like a pretty big cross-cutting concern, and it would look like, like a isolation segment that only runs cells and, only, you know, and they, they support ARM. Other questions? Okay, well, I have good news. We, there's only one more talk left. I'm going to turn it over to Ram Tinjus Carson. Thank you. David, is this the shortest talk you've ever given? Uh, well, it's one of the fastest talks I've ever given. <laughs> if that's what you mean. Thanks, David. And now, finally, we have uh, Carson here to talk a little bit about logs. Yes. Excuse me.
Hello, everyone. So welcome to the future of logs and metrics in Cloud Foundry. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about my experience diving into Cloud Foundry's logging and metrics architecture, uh, a vision for its future, and some recent advancements in the space. So before we get started, uh, I just want to give a brief introduction. My name is Carson Long. I love hiking, solving complex problems, and coffee mugs. Currently an engineer for VMware, and also an approver in the app runtime deployments, app runtime platform, and foundational infrastructure working groups. So uh, the story of the talk, it begins with a group of brave developers taking charge of a complex space, the logging and metrics architecture of Cloud Foundry. So the engineers were initially flummoxed by the system. Uh, no less than three versions of Cloud Foundry's logging and metrics architecture are, excuse me, are currently in support, most with overlapping concerns. And did I mention they're all on by default? These side-by-side -side diagrams represent most of the current architecture and hopefully give a glimpse into how complex the job of teasing everything apart was. Uh, to be clear, today I'm going to be mostly focusing upon application logging and metrics as they flow through the Cloud Foundry system. Um, so even though system metrics is on here, I'm not going to talk much about that. So how did we get to the place that we're currently in? Uh, it was not built in a day. Before there was anything, there was Loggergator v1. Well, it's not entirely true, but we're going to start with Loggergator v1 because it's one of the only things uh, still in, in place from that time. It was built to be a push-based system with no back pressure uh, and send custom formatted logs and metrics to be buffered through Doppler VMs onto log API VMs, then onto custom CF nozzles, and finally onto log syncs. Uh, Loggerator V2 came next. Uh, it was built to provide better support for log and metric filtering. Uh, by CF nozzles, easing the networking burden. This was achieved by replacing certain V1 components with uh, gRPC-based components and changing out the V1 custom format for a new custom format. And Shared Nothing is the most recent addition to the system. It removes most of the network hops by uh, getting rid of the VMs in between the agents on the, on the uh, other VM, on the component VMs and um, sending, sending those logs and metrics directly from the agents to the various VMs, uh, to the various log and metric syncs. So it seems like from what we've discovered, each version was meant to supersede the previous version, uh, but none of them ever got enough momentum in the past to actually deprecate the previous versions and take over. Uh, so where do we go from here? Unfortunately, um, I have to own up that my talk is part presentation of a vision, part request. Because while there's alignment on the future of logs in Cloud Foundry, the future of metrics is a little more up in the air. No, no definitive plan has yet been made. Uh, and if you're interested in hearing what ideas are being discussed, or if you want to bring your own ideas to the table, I encourage you to please reach out in Slack. Uh, you can find most of us in either the ARP Slack channel or the Logging and Metrics Slack channel. Now comes logs. This is this is the bit where we have a vision. Um, so the loggerator architecture has a couple large flaws that immediately became apparent when we started poking around. Dopplers and log API VMs have a horizontal scaling limit imposed by the increasing number of network hops uh, required for each VM added. At a certain point, adding more, uh, more of either VM is more likely to slow down the system than it is to speed up the system. Also, the custom log egress of the loggergator architecture requires Cloud Foundry-specific nozzles uh, to communicate logs to external log sync solutions. 
It's not ideal. Shared nothing, on the other hand, seems to resolve those problems. Removing the middle bits of the diagram and sending the uh, logs directly from agents to external log syncs removes any concerns about scaling Doppler and log API VMs um, and pushes those directly onto the Diego cells, which are already the main concern of app uh, of platform operators, making sure your, your apps stay up, right? Um, additionally, Shared Nothing utilizes syslog, an industry standard for message logging. Uh, that generally eliminates the need for Cloud Foundry-specific nozzles. Many of the log management solutions that folks seem to use already provide native support for syslog, which is pretty cool. Uh, those aren't even the only benefits, though, as obviating the need for Doppler and log API VMs could save quite a bit of money by eliminating a lot of VMs in a deployment. Plus, the diagram is so much simpler to look at, for me at least. Uh, for those reasons and more, the engineers working on the logging and metrics architecture have decided that shared nothing is once again to be the future of logs in Cloud Foundry. So please switch your deployments to shared nothing by making sure syslog ingress is turned on in log cache. Log cache is sticking around, by the way. That's not part of Loggergator. That's part of the broader uh, logging system. By using aggregate syslog drains to egress logs and ultimately by turning off the flow of logs into Loggergator v1 and v2, using them just for metrics while we figure out the situation for metrics. And uh, the community has actually already started working on this, which is pretty awesome. Uh, we're, we're moving towards a future where shared nothing is the go-to logging architecture for Cloud Foundry. Uh, so recently, LogCache, which used to be on uh, Doppler VMs, is, has been moved out to its own LogCache VMs, which is the first step to being able to scale Doppler down to zero. Log rate limiting is an exciting new feature that just came out recently. If you're using it, actually, please give us feedback. We're excited to hear what folks think. Um, it treats, it, 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 it applies flexible quotas and log rate limits to applications and spaces and orgs, treating logs like the precious resource that they are. Um, and finally, some awesome engineers from SAP are also working on bringing mutual TLS to syslog drains, which is very cool. So thank you all for listening. That is my lightning talk. Uh, I was planning to say go to the happy hour, don't bother with questions and hit me in Slack, but we have like 30 extra minutes if someone wants to ask a question. number of or amount or volume of logs is guaranteed like with some guarantee to synchronize like with the SLI. So the problem is that uh, when uh, someone's trying to uh, develop and just push some SAS application uh, quite often they're not getting like old all, all, all logs like or just you know like some some logs are skipped so if I, if I heard you right, the question is, is there going to be improvements made into the flow from apps to uh, log cache, probably, so that the CFCLI can gather more logs? Is that correct? It's not more. Like, it's just like some dev mode like designed like for low volume uh, amount of logs, but to ensure like that all actual lines or data like from this log just get into the developer's uh, console. Um, I don't, well, I don't think we're currently planning anything for a dev mode, um, but maybe you can repeat the question in, in Cloud Foundry Slack if that's okay and we can talk about it a little bit more. Anyone else? Cool. Uh, thanks, everyone. Thanks, Carson. Uh, that's it, everybody. Thanks so much. Um
Thank you to all the presenters today. Thank you again to uh, any nines and VMware, our sponsors. Um, that was a great day. We've got uh, a bit of time now before the reception this evening. It, runs, it starts at 5.30 at Wright & Company. Um, and that's about a 15 minute walk from here. You can also take the Detroit People Mover there. Uh, Ram and I rode it yesterday. It's super fun. It's this little um, like uh, Mr. Rogers train that runs around all the hotels here. It's a three mile loop. Uh, and if you get off at the Broadway station on the People Mover, um, it's right next to the restaurant. And there is a People Mover stop in this building somewhere. Um, on the fourth floor, just go up the uh, um, escalators to the fourth floor and the gate is right there. Yeah, so probably nice, nice time for a walk, but the People Mover is a great option too. Um, looking forward to seeing you all at the reception tonight. Yeah, thanks everyone for you know, making it out here and just with your presence, making the event a success. Also, big thanks to Sarah at the AV booth there. Thanks, Thank Sarah. You, Sarah. Oh, and uh, Deb and Naomi on the LF Events team who did a lot of a lot the legwork for work. this. Yeah. Um, <laughs> last thing is uh, we are booth S10 for the next three days. Yeah. Uh, cool. On the... Uh, floor there at the sponsor showcase so yeah, yeah thanks for everyone who's signed up to help us out with the booth um but everyone else please you know stop in and say hi all right thanks. that's a wrap thanks all